number or what the hell it is is yeah. being misinterpreted. It's visually the same. Well, sometimes you can tell. Right. Sometimes you can. My, my suspicion is that guy came from Piper as a Roll a form up. I mean, the person he was talking with him was that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. My son was complaining last night that people wanted him to create file names with slashes in them. Oh, no. And he thought they were pretty stupid that they were doing that. And they ran idiots last night. Oh, wait a second. You can create a lot of that. Yeah, I think most people at this point just say they're program versus it's not really similar. It's going to, probably going to be interpreted as a directory reference. Right. Well, it depends. Yeah. There may be, it can wire into the computer. Yeah. 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 You know how to do that. Yeah, we know. <laughs> I remember having a lot of fun with that exercise in the operating system class that I was trying to teach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Slashes and dots. So far, nobody has been. I think it gets me is embedded in commas. That guy, one guy, I think, lost that. That's one of the guys that worked at the way that our CSV files are set up. Some good time to make rows. Yeah. It sucks. I agree. I want to put my my shoes. I'm step on something. What I often talk about is life has become much more complicated than it was when I was a boy. In many many ways. Yeah, same here, Charlie, but for me it was partially because I got married. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. I, I, uh, we, we have a lot of fun at home with the computer and the iPad and the iPhone, yeah. Because if her computer is a Mac, I don't always know what the hell it's doing. <laughs> son was asking the high school math teacher what imaginary numbers are good for and she was unable to give him any kind of an answer and finally I was able to fake something and make him a little happy about life. <laughs> Quantum computers. Pardon me? Quantum computers. Quantum computers. Oh. Imaginary numbers are kind of well, I know there's elect electrical, electronics kinds of stuff where they often pop up. I, I can't remember any more details. Pardon? Rackles. Yeah, that too. That too. Anything involving, uh, you're right, anything involving uh, uh, alternating current. No. But when you get I've often thought that I'd like to block out a bunch of time and get my, a couple of my old math books out and start from page one and go back through and then see how much I can remember or how much I can remind myself of. It's very hard to read old textbooks. 
Well, the really old ones. Yeah, I, I have some that aren't that old that yeah. they're unreadable. Have you ever read the new books? Uh, programming books? I know. Oh, I've looked at that. Those are very I've humble. looked at that. Very humble. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, yeah. he wrote this map. Well, I wonder what I mean. Incredibly bad. Yes, uh, we looked at it with these pieces. It's not 10, 11 minutes after. This watch is usually really correct. Wow. <laughs> and, and everybody knows who I am. I don't have to tell you, right? Anybody doesn't know who I am? All right. Oh, you know. You know. Or you're, you're doing the same confused old man act that I'm doing, so you can't remember them. Uh, we had 40-something RSVPs, and I was actually getting worried that this room wasn't going to be big enough. Now, there's one or two of the people who RSVP changed the thing to no, and the rest of them are maybe lost on campus or decided they didn't want to go out in the rain or I don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, so we have to know they'll say who sent it Yeah. Well, the meetup sends the reminders, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that, that's, I don't bother sending out reminders because I think meetup does it. So I'm not going to worry. Just a uh, couple things here. For anybody that doesn't know, we've got that Buffalo Data Google group that uh, Tyler set up. And if you uh, join that, you will get some notices of things that we're doing. Uh, the next thing for November, I'm not going to be around, and Oliver is going to be otherwise occupied in November. He's got some feeble excuse about having a baby or something. <laughs> and uh, Tyler got together with Chris Weibel, and they're coming up with something about Docker and so on, which they're going to put on at Stark and Wayne which is down the road, it's not far from here. He's going to give me a write-up, and I will get it posted soon. And uh, it's it going to be a hands-on tutorial. Yeah. So yeah, really yeah. helpful if you bring a laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the whole point of it is to bring your machine and walk away with something that you can yeah. use when you go home. Or else bring a friend who has a laptop if for some reason you don't. And then in uh, December, we did this once last year, we're going to try the lightning talks again. That was fairly successful when we did it. So I'll get some kind of a write-up about that. Uh, what else am I going to say here before we do anything else? I'm going to say I'm sticking with just having the snack, snacks as opposed to pizzas and fried chicken and all that kind of stuff. So help yourselves with some cookies and some drinks. Uh, and that is courtesy of both Engine Yard and Stark and Wayne. And uh, if you save me the cans of bottles, I'll take them back and get nickels for them. And if you don't, I won't. And what else do I have to tell you? Let me think about this for a minute. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to just mention that we don't yet have plans for next year, starting in January. In fact, Tyler and Oliver and I are going to have to get together pretty soon and see what we can come up with. Uh, I always have some trouble finding ways to find somebody that we can coerce into giving us a talk. And be very happy to hear from anybody who wants to volunteer up themselves, or if they have a acquaintance they'd like to volunteer, that would be fine. Uh, we might get one out of Oliver and we might get some student talks and I haven't quite figured out. For some reason this is one of the times when, when I'm worried about finding speakers when I ask myself why I have to do this to myself. But <laughs> we see what we can do. So any, any, any help with that will be help. Uh, Theoretically, the talk is going to start about now. Uh, Mike gave a TED talk here in Buffalo about a year ago. He and his partner were together. They wrote this book. And, and I think any introducing of him that needs to be done, I'm going to let him do for himself. Uh, and the other thing I can say, where is Alan? Right there he is. I had to ask a hard question. 
and we got a little discussion going that some of you noticed, and, and it included me, that this given being the subject matter, uh, we could get into some heated discussion, and I'll just ask you all to be careful about that. Now there was somebody put a comment on Meetup, uh, Lisa somebody, you know you here? She's not here, so we'll see if she's going to come in. And, she was going to make a country Pardon? Based on uh, what, it, what is it? Yeah, it was a recent comment. It was a recent comment. I could find it here. She's got expertise in behavioral something or other. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe she's lost trying to find us. Maybe she's here. But I, I would say whenever Mike and the Spirit moves you, I would say you can start. And uh, I'm a little puzzled. Is this Lisa? It is. Yeah, I was just talking about uh -oh. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so we're going to let Rick start and we're going to see what happens. We're going to have any fist fights. Okay. Well, I'm Lisa Hall. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Hall of Fame. Okay. 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 And you can tell them whatever you want to know about you. And I'm apologizing a little bit. I really expected more people tonight. I don't know what the hell is going on. Humans are unpredictable. Maybe we've got some bad data. <laughs> not to leave, not to leave. So, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everyone. My name is Mike Glock. Um, as Charlie said, I gave a TEDx talk here in Buffalo last year. Um, a co-author and I wrote this book about data, misleading data. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you some examples of that. Just to preface it, I'm not a statistician, I don't have a PhD, my co-author is the expert when it comes to that, but what I do, I ask a lot of questions, and I can share some stories about the misleading data. And I'd love it if this could be more of a conversation as well. If you have a question, if you have something to add, some insight, absolutely raise your hand, let's get the discussion going. And fair warning, there are some political examples here that I'm going to share. Um, but it's not about the politics. Hopefully it's about sharing the data and looking at how it's interpreted. So good data, bad data, how can you tell? Well, first of all, let's talk about what is data. How many of you wear a Fitbit or Apple Watch or some sort of fitness tracker? Right? How many of you read the news this morning or watched the weather report? Right? Um, how many of you listened to or stepped on the scale this morning? So all those things are sources of data. And a lot of times, for most people, when they think of data, they just think, OK, spreadsheets and numbers and things like that. But it's not. There's all this data around us. And in fact, what we found in researching our book is that if you printed out all the data that you consume on a daily basis, it would fill up 34 pickup trucks. So that's a huge amount of data that you're consuming in an average day. But the problem is that so much of it is misleading. So how do we recognize the good from the bad? You know, we're not just talking about <laughs> Could do a whole talk about that, but we're not going to. We're not going to talk about hoaxes. This is one, you know, Britney Spears died. Well, she didn't die. Someone hacked their account. Here's another hoax that actually got a lot of traction from the AP. Their account was hacked. And what happened here, as soon as this was posted, the stock market went down. Okay, it lost, I got the number here, I want to say about $36 billion in value in just a few minutes. So, you know, the fake data and the hoaxes can have a real impact. But um, here's another fun example. Can anybody yet think why Britain might have 17,000 pregnant men? Well, because women have registered to vote indirectly? Oh, close. <laughs> So it was a coding error, right? So when you go to the doctor, you get a test, someone has to fill out what you're there for, why you're there. Well, someone entered, men as women, or pregnancy instead of something else that the guys were there for, and the country ended up with 17,000 pregnant men. So here's some examples of some misleading headlines. We're gonna come back to these at the end of the talk, but just to give you an example of what's out there. The average American household owes $90,000. Starbucks increases neighborhood and home values. One of my favorites, one in five CEOs are psychopaths, study finds. Should be higher. Buffalo ranked third best food city in the world by National Geographic. 
<laughs> Are you hungry? Best to eat first and shop later. Another favorite, grilled cheese lovers have more sense and are better people, according to survey. Huffington Post. Huffington Post. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, good point, right? Like, where is the news coming from? I have to tell you, I like grilled cheese because people have haven't gotten that message. No. Nope. They didn't want to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the word out for you. <laughs> have a beer, it's good for your brain. <laughs> so what we're going to do, we're going to walk through some statistical concepts and give some examples of each one and why they can be misleading. So let's start with one here. Averages, aggregates, and outliers. These are my kids. Ben is on the left, he's 11 years old. Zach is on the right, he's 13. Their average age is 12 years old, but neither one of them is 12. So, as you know, averages can be very misleading. Another example we can give, let's look at the average income of residents in, let's say, an apartment building that has 10 rooms in it. So you have 10 buildings, not 10 people live there, nine of them are monks. They earn $50,000 a year. Bill Gates moves in. He earned about $11.5 billion last year, right? How do you determine the average income for that building? Median. Median? Why median? Because it's more representative of the whole. Okay. Does everyone here know mean versus median versus? So I believe we don't. Make believe we don't? Okay. So typically, one way people think of averages is the mean, right? Where you add up all the numbers and divide by the number of people or the number of data points there, right? So my kids, 11 and 13 years old, add them up, 24, divide by two since they're two kids, average age is 12. But the median and mode are different. The median is, let me make sure I get this right here. The median is the middle value in the data set. So if you have these 10 people in this apartment building, and nine of them are monks, and then one is Bill Gates, the median makes $50,000. And then the mode is the data points or the points that's most frequently found in the data. So again, you have nine people making 50, one person making 11 and a half billion, so the mode is going to be 50. So when you look at it like that, you know, you can very easily skew the numbers. Whenever you see an average, you have to ask, okay, what is it an average of, and what type of average is it? Here's another example. I spoke recently to a group of college admissions officers, and we found this study that said 37% of students are prepared for college-level math and reading. But what sort of questions should we be asking about that? Right. Yes, Oliver. What does prepared mean? Great question. What does prepared mean? How are they quantifying that? How many students were asked? Mm -hmm. How many were in that sample? And what does that 37% mean? Is that an average? Does it apply to all students? Not necessarily, because when we look, and it breaks it down, if you look at the students by gender, only 33% of the guys were prepared versus 42% of the women. You can look at it by ethnicity, and there were vast differences there as well. Everything from, well, I see 17% up to 49%. When you look at it by the level of parental education, 18% for students whose parents didn't finish high school, up to 49% for parents who graduated from college. So no surprise there, but when you look at a headline, and most people do just read headlines, when you look at that and say, okay, 37%, and that's a headline you're going to see in US News or USA Today, well, that 37% is taking all of those students and treating them the same. And as we know, there are major differences amongst all of them, and even within these groups as well, right? If you break down the group of the students who graduated from college, or the students whose parents graduated from college, is there a difference in terms of parents who have a bachelor's versus a master's versus a PhD, multiple degrees, where they got the degree from, right? You can slice and dice the data so many different ways. All right, here's an interesting one. Who would ever say when I grow up, 
I want to be the deputy mayor. Well, you might say that because in the United States, the average U.S. mayor salary, $62,000, versus the average deputy mayor, $83,000. Anyone yeah. know why this is? Because there's a lot of cities that would need a mayor, but not necessarily a deputy mayor. And it's going to be larger cities that would require a deputy mayor. Exactly. Right? So every city needs a mayor. I mean, a city of 5,000, 10,000 people, you're going to have a mayor. But it's only the largest cities that have those deputy mayors. You know, as an example, when we looked at the data, New York City has four deputy mayors. Each of them make $200,000. So you're looking at that very select group, which raises the average up. That was totally against my I was just jumping to it. Well done. You read the book. <laughs> Talk for a second about outliers. <laughs> when you think about an outlier, typically it's something that's far outside the norm, right? I think there's actually a statistical definition of it in terms of you know two deviations away from the mean or whatever. Um, and we talk in our book about a court case where there was a billion dollar verdict for a tobacco company where they looked at the sales from their stores, and one store was an outlier in Washington, D.C. If you include that data, it makes the result look skewed, and they won a billion dollars. So that's how people typically think of outliers. But you know, an example I like to use is coffee. Anyone here add cream to their coffee? Okay. So what happens when you add a couple drops of cream to your coffee? It turns pale. Right? So the coffee is still 95% coffee, or 99% even, but just adding that little bit drastically changes the appearance of it. Just like they did for that court case as well. Here's a question. Can anyone guess why 44% of presidents are outliers? Good guess. No, it's not because they come from different states. Their height? No, not, the, not their height. Yeah, what's the scale that they're outliers on? What's the scale that they're outliers on? Well, that would give it away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. So think about their terms, right? Most presidents serve for either exactly four years or exactly eight years. But because some of them, President Lincoln here, are assassinated in office or take over early in office, 44% um, actually serve for shorter or longer periods of time than that four or eight year period, give or take a day. So just because it's an outlier doesn't mean it's one out of a hundred data points or one out of a thousand data points. Technically, you can have an outlier that's still a significant percentage. No, I think he was the only one who was more than eight years, but you would people shorter than eight. Shorter than eight, or right? Take, take, or someone who took over for yeah, someone who was assassinated, right? <clears throat> so, hopefully everyone recognizes this as, as an electoral map. Red states, this is from 2012. Red states are where the Republicans got the vote. Blue states are where the Democrats got the vote. So, in 2012, in Texas, Barack, Barack Obama got more than 3 million votes. But none of them counted in the election because of how the data was compiled, of how it was aggregated. And aggregated data is something else you have to watch out for when you're thinking about averages. And what happens is when you look at the results county by county, the map looks a lot different, right? So now you're aggregating at the county level, not just at the state level. If you take it even further and not look, look not only at the aggregation, but how strongly each county voted for them, you get a different result as well. So here it's not just red, it's not just blue, it's to what degree did that candidate win the county? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, is that one coming? Yep, so tell, tell us about this. It's, the population will blow up or shrink the geographical area. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. Because I know we're about half and half everywhere, so why are we never half and half? Because it's gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, absolutely. Yeah. And also because you know, of geography. People look at a map like this and say, oh wow, so many more people 
voted Republican. Well, based on land mass and geography, sure, if you want to play it that way. If you want to look at the true, dis the true vote cell, now, this is a great way to do it, where the size is representative. It's called a cartograph, I believe. Um, and there are different ways to do this. I mean, you may have seen some where they do it by state, so each state is a different size. You can do each county a different size, but it's an interesting way to look at the data. You know, you're probably not going to see a map like this in something like USA Today, but <laughs> as you get into more sophisticated analyses of it, I don't know how much you better, isn't it? yeah. So when you think about averages and outliers, remember the average is just one snapshot of the data. Right? When I say my the average age of my kids is 12 years old, even if it was right, even if they were 14 and 10 and the average was 12 years old, that's only one snapshot. That doesn't tell you um, how tall they are, how smart they are, what they like, anything else about them. It just tells you one thing. You need to ask an average of what? Is it an average of the state votes, county votes, something else? Think about the variation that can be obscured by that data. Right? And then think about outliers. Ask if there are any. Look for them. Find out how many there are, and think about the impact that they can have on the average as well. Uh, Mike, in your building example, would Gates be an outlier? Or I believe he would. Yeah, yeah, I was just checking if I had the right meaning here. Yeah. yeah. It's a bimodal distribution. Well, it, it's a good question, because actually, so, bit of background, my co-author is an economist, and he runs a consulting firm that does economic analysis for large companies and lawsuits and things like that. So for example, he worked for the NFL Players Association and they did a report when they went on strike a few years ago to find out what is the price of an injury. How much does, that, how much does a broken arm cost an NFL receiver over the course of his career? And so that's when you get into questions like, is that an outlier, right? So in the Conwood case, which I mentioned before, the billion dollar jury case, one side argued that this one store is an outlier, and the other case side argued that it's not an outlier. And the judge agreed with the expert who said it's not. Any other questions or comments about averages, aggregates, outliers? Correlation and causation. Anybody want to tell me why there's a correlation between ice cream sales and the murder rate? Poor mother. Well, you you exactly. I'm kind of these people are more irritable, but I might be wrong. Nope, you're right. Warm weather, hot days. So when it's warmer outside, people buy more ice cream. What's warmer outside, there are more murders. <clears throat> okay. Eating ice cream doesn't make you want to kill people. But there is a correlation. <laughs> Steal my ice cream cone. <laughs> right. So what would you do if you wanted to get smarter? Now these are some real headlines. People who wear glasses are smarter. Smarter minds are left-handed people smarter. Why intelligent people drink more alcohol. We found studies that talked about the music that makes you smarter or dumber. So if you listen to Beethoven over here, you're going to have a higher SAT score versus if you listen to Beyonce or jazz or Jay-Z around this side, right? Probably with Radiohead strikes me. Radiohead's up there, right? right? You could believe it, but you wouldn't say that, that not if I wanted to I'm Soka, trying to find you wouldn't say back. Soka causes stupidity and Beethoven <laughs> causes smartness. I think Nickelback, Nickelback's on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like how smart I know, correlated and that's so causing so it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. These are great examples. How big the outcast bubble is. Yeah, and we found examples in doing the research that you know what else makes you smarter. You know, one study found if you're a Republican, you're smarter. If you stay up late, you're smarter. If you drink more, you're smarter. But like you're saying, these are all correlations, not causation. But you don't know that unless you really dig in. Something from CNN: Smarter people use iPhones. Study says, right? Mm. But when you dig in, and this was looking at the article, reading the full article, clicking on the study, and going into there, it said, okay, it explains the procedure. iPhone usage rates were positively correlated with education level. So there's no causation there. All they did was they looked at the education rates 
for a state, right, on average, and they correlated that versus how many people are using an iPhone. I'd like to ask how they decided what it meant to be smarter. Because being kind of educated might not necessarily mean you're smarter. That's, well, that's great. Example. My guess is Apple funded that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good point about how the media interprets this, right? And remember, the media's job is to get more impressions, to have more people see its articles. So they're going to write catchy headlines and try and draw you in. So they're never going to have a headline that says there's a positive correlation between iPhone usage and education rates. Mm -hmm. They're going to craft it in a way that's going to draw people in and, and um, make you want to share this with your friends. Of that. I saw a really good tweet once that said, if there's ever a headline that has a question mark at the end of it, the answer is always no. Is air going to kill you? No. <laughs> Lack of air. <laughs> yeah, like this one. Yeah. Right. Right. Question mark at the end smart, of it. Yes. Right? Yes. And that's a great way, we'll talk about language in a bit, that's a great way to put something out there but not commit to it. Okay. Here's another one. Again, I spoke about this to the higher education audience. There's this Trump effect that some colleges are seeing lower admissions or lower application rates from international students. But why is that? Everyone just assumes, or people who aren't familiar with it assume, oh, it's because of Trump and his policies, yada, yada, yada. But the New York Times looked into it and said, OK, well, at some schools, the numbers are up. So how does that explain? Could it be a reaction to India's currency shortage? Is it about crude oil prices in Saudi Arabia? Is it about the visa program that a lot of international students come here on? Right? So just because there's a correlation between Trump being in office, <coughs> his politics, and international applications being down in most schools doesn't mean that one thing caused the other. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Maybe there are secondary factors at play as well. This was interesting. The biggest decline was from students from China. Now, that's not one of the countries affected by the Muslim ban. So how do you explain that in light of all of this? And it could be there's one cause for China, there's one cause for India, and another one for other countries. All right? The point is you need to dig deeper and really start asking questions about, OK, what is the relationship in the data? What is causing it? And does it apply to the large group? or are there differences as you drill further in? So think about what's being represented in the news article or the research. Think about what else could be driving the results. And remember, you know, this is something my co-author says all the time, proving causation, especially in his line of work as an expert witness, is a very high bar. Any questions, thoughts, comments about relationships? Yes. No. The way that IEP addresses are uh, associated to locales. If you have things, uh, there is one place near Lawrence, Kansas, the geographical center of the United States, one address that is given for all the anonymized trolling. And so these people have like you know, a sheriff's car parked outside their house all the time. Because people come and check you and they are absolutely incensed. How dare you say this to us? But this is a direct response. If you look up, if you Google um, uh, why is Bain living healthy because of the internet or something like that, it's, uh, it's been going on for years. And this is strictly because of the way that they uh, attribute locality to the IP addresses in the United States. For people who anonymize. Right. So it's sort of smack in the middle of you know, it's not coming from there at all. Right, so. Okay, let's talk about sampling. Does anyone, yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say, is um, typically when you have a larger data set, is that uh, more of a, uh, a positive um, correlation than a causation? Or is that not necessarily, could you just be looking at something, finding something different Good question. So you're asking, are you more likely to see correlation rather than causation if yeah. the sample set is larger? Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I would assume that with a larger sample set, you're more likely to find a real result, to find causation, or at least have the data to be able to dig in and find it, but I don't know. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Good question. <laughs> Who remembers the Challenger disaster? Space Shuttle Challenger. So there were seven people on board, including Greg Jarvis, who got his engineering degree here at UB. And so imagine what the engineers had to think about the night before the launch. You've got seven lives at risk. If you make a mistake, it's going to cost almost $2 billion. And the outcome is going to be broadcast live on national TV. And what they were debating was whether the O-rings would work or not. So what happened was, the night before liftoff, they knew it was going to be about 15 degrees colder the next morning than it had been for any previous shuttle launches. And the engineers were concerned about the performance of something called the O-ring. It's like a big rubber washer, for lack of a better term. And what it did, it sealed together two parts of one of the fuel tanks so that hot gases couldn't escape. And they, they knew that in cold temperatures, the O-ring didn't perform as well. It wasn't as elastic. It wouldn't stretch under those um, extremely high temperatures to fill the gap as well. But So they were wondering, would it work well enough or no? And so what they did, they looked at flights that had had O-ring distress in the past. And what they qualified as over in distress was any time that there were signs that some of the hot gas had escaped or that there had been some issue with the O-ring. So they looked at this and said, okay, there was O-ring distress, in fact, two incidents of it on a flight when it was launched at 75 degrees. There were two more incidents on two separate flights when it was 70 degrees, so on and so forth. So what they saw was that, okay, at 53 degrees up to 75 degrees, they had had problems with the O-rings in the past. And what they determined from this analysis was that the temperature does not determine the O-ring performance for the actual shuttle launches. You might have a problem when it's warm, you might have a problem when it's cold. But what they didn't do, this was only a subset of the data. These are only the flights that had a problem with the O-ring. And what happens when you look at it, when you look at all the data, here, these are all the flights where there weren't any problems with the O-rings. And so what do you notice about those? They're all above 65. Right? Every time there's no problem, it's above 65 degrees. Any flight below 65 degrees, you're going to have an incident, or there was an incident in the past. So if the engineers had looked at all of this data, and been able to convince their superiors to look at all of this data too, because there were there were communications issues, there were all sorts of problems, right? This was not the only issue, but if this data had been communicated clearly to the people who were in charge of the launch, hopefully they would have scrubbed it and you would have had a very different result. So that's a good example of sampling and why it's important to look at all of the data. Um, we saw last year in the election, at least, you know, we did a lot of analysis on polls and things like that and saw a lot of issues in terms of sampling and where that data is coming from. <coughs> so here's an article about Hillary's lead shrinking over Trump. But what was interesting for me was that you looked at the bottom of the article. It was a survey monkey election poll. So as you read this, what issues did you, do you see in terms of how they're sampling this data? Survey. Internet users. users. I mean, it's <coughs> what, what about internet users? Why is that a problem? Self-select. Self-select, right? It's people who choose to take the survey. And to your point, it's people who are on the internet. Not everybody is, right? Yeah. And specifically, people that are on the survey monkey platform. Exactly. And they pay people to take surveys in some cases. Because if you the result is going to be meaningful. Anybody who's going to vote is going to be equally likely to be part of the sample, yeah. which is the real sticking point about all these surveys in general. 
And that's, and that's why you have margin of error in surveys, where you'll say, okay, margin of error plus or minus 4%, 5%. Yeah. Can I ask what in the world does that whole number? What does that, next slide, thanks for getting that up there. So here was a study, Trump dominates the Republican field. In this one, the margin of error was 4.4%. And what that meant, in this case at least, was that if the survey were repeated using the same questions and methodology, 19 times out of 20, the results would be within 4.4 percentage points, plus or minus. So it's not even saying it's definitively within that plus or minus 4.4, which is actually an 8.8 range when you put it together, right? It's saying that 95% of the time, that's going to be true. Yeah, but there's do you have to do anything that's true or not? I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a good example. Yep. And I know they should put in there, but something that I think is kind of interesting about these polls uh, is a guy, Nate Silver, who was a statistician, he and company have a website. And what they do is they look at a whole list of polls and they try to evaluate the methodology and they try to evaluate the consistency and accuracy and they give each one a rating and then they make a weighted average. So when you're saying that the president is or is not popular, I, I've been thinking that their weighted, weighted average is probably much more accurate than any individual poll. And you look at the individual polls and you see the numbers do vary quite a bit. And they, they take a informed look at why they vary and how much they're going to count that particular poll. It's actually, I actually find it very interesting to look at. And that, is that on Nate's site on 538? Yeah, it's at 538. In fact, it's usually on the front pages of the result, and then you can <coughs> put on something and they'll give you some more details, and they'll talk a little bit about how they don't tell enough about how they do it, but they do talk about how they do it. Yeah, do too well with the election. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> do, do too well with the election. No. That the, the media had a, a bit of a field day with them, pretty much even leading up to the, the very end, uh, he was basically saying this is really close. And while it's probably likely that Hillary's gonna win, I, I'm not gonna, not gonna say things either way. Everyone else then kind of took that as, oh, Hillary's gonna win, great, great. But no, he, he, he was pretty clear about the fact that he's not sure. That's not a good sound like. Yes, for most of the campaign, he was putting you know enormous leads, Democratic leads, and you know in a, in a little tiny footnote, it's just not all the data in there. But most of it, have all these clowns are even reading this, and it's a ninety percent chance of victory. And mm -hmm. you know, closer to seventy-seven in a couple of weeks leading up to it. His poll wasn't showing the outcome; it was showing the probability exactly. of. Hillary or Trump winning, not the actual vote. Oh, yeah, so that's that snapshot in time, it was accurate. Just like eight years ago, it would never predict Trump would win because he wasn't running. But at the time, like when he was snapshotting, it was accurate for that time. That's not one to vote. That was your snapshot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right, here's another example about sampling. So, headline from the Buffalo News, area Niagara among the 15 unhealthiest counties in the state. So where does this data come from? How do they determine this? One factor they used was drinking water violations. <coughs> so what do you notice from this map when you look at the county by county drinking water violations? They're all the population centers. Right, all the population centers. Well, what's the dark versus the light? What's that yeah. here? So there's no variation, there's just dark versus light, yes versus no, right? Yeah, both Niagara and your ear. <laughs> right, so what dark blue means is that yes, there was a violation, or that yes, they do have unhealthy water, and no means that no, they don't have unhealthy water. Okay, so they're not looking at any gradations there, it's either yes or no, it's binary. But then when you dig in even further, your yes, Niagara, no. I guess indicates at least one water system in the county 
received at least one health-based violation during the specified time frame. Niagara Falls gets one a week. Right? <laughs> so, so, you so, you've got this month. <laughs> so you've got 52 water systems in Erie County, okay? 24 in Niagara County. You're looking at a full one-year time period. And like you're saying, there's great variation in the data. This is almost cut off here, but you can see some places have zero, some places have 50. And I think this was only the data for one quarter. So if one community water system in New York County has one violation, boom, that automatically affects their data for the entire county. And then you also need to look at, from a sampling perspective, where does this data come from? And this is beyond just the water. This is in terms of all the health factors. They look at census data going back to 2000 and 2010. This is a study that just came out, or a report that just came out in 2016. And a lot, this happens a lot, actually. So when you read something in the newspaper, it's talking about data from years and years ago. This may be the most comprehensive data they have. That's why they use it. They use data from phone surveys. So again, who's answering their phone? Who's taking the time to talk? It's using self-reported data where, OK, I'm telling you that I don't feel well, and now you're going to mark that on a survey that's going to have wider implications. And obviously, it's only a sample of the population. Another fun example from the Buffalo News, patient safety group gives A scores to three Buffalo area hospitals. Well, how did they get that data? It's a voluntary survey. And when you look specifically locally, you have the Catholic hospitals, and then you have Kaleida Health, which includes Suburban, Gates, DeGraff, and others, right? And typically, Kaleida in these surveys is grouped as one. So you don't see any variation amongst the different hospitals. The graph may be here, suburban may be here, but you're only looking at the one data point. So when you're thinking about sampling, think about what data was used to draw those conclusions, what happens if you draw a conclusion based on the wrong sample, as we saw with the challenger, and importantly, can you extend the results beyond the group that was studied? Something related to sampling, I'm sure everybody's heard of, is cherry picking, right? This is a graph of students who are employed by uh, looking at their school enrollment. And so if I'm looking at the bottom line here, and I want to make the argument that employment is actually on the rise, I can easily do that. Just take the years from 2010 on. It shows a slight upward trend. If I want to say, no, actually, employment's on the decline, I just look at the larger range. This is fairly benign, but it gets into you know, some serious consequences when you're looking at climate change or economic trends, things like that, where you're cherry picking that data. A fun example, you see it a lot in sports. This was from a few years ago when the Sabres got a point in eight of their last nine games and 16 of their last 18. Well, someone from their marketing department looked at all the data and said, what's the best thing we can say about the Sabres right now? because this was up on their website. <laughs> <laughs> like Yay. So think about with cherry picking, how was the statistics selected? And ask, what was the date range? What was the time range? Um, are there vague or arbitrary labels that you need to watch out for there? Any questions or thoughts about sampling or cherry picking? Did you hear the story about the airplane in World War II that the mathematician, when they uh, they would look at all the planes coming back, and they would see what the holes in the plane were, and they would add more armor to try to protect the planes, and they would still uh, they kept losing planes. So then this mathematician figured out, well, we need to add the armor where the holes aren't, because the planes that are coming back, they're coming back. So we need to we need to put the armor where the you know there are no holes because those are the planes that are you know we're losing. So it reminded me of when you showed the, uh, the NASA. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a World War II. If you Google it, it's interesting. Libraries well, only work like that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about forecasting and probability. This is one that, that's been in the news a lot recently with the hurricanes. So, what, do you, what are you really looking at when you're looking at one of these maps? What is this data telling you? Georgia is going to get wet. Mm -hmm. Where the eye of the storm will be at those specific 
points and how strong the storm will be. Okay. Is it that tone of probability? That Wednesday's not a good day to be in Puerto Rico. Average Thursday or Friday. You're saying this. The probability is the storm is going to be in this area. So how do you know? So you said cone of uncertainty, right? Yeah. yeah you yeah, talked yeah. about probability. Right, probably the sixty percent. How do you, right, but how do you know from looking yeah. at a map like this on the news that it's based on probability? The red line. Okay. And how do you know that? Well, it's a guess because they drew the center, and that's their expectation. Mm -hmm. But because they fanned it out further and further as time went on, they're like, well, it couldn't wander around. And they're also lightening the thickness of the line as they go north. So you said the word expectation, and that's exactly what it's based on, right? They're giving you a forecast based on the probabilities. And so that's something you might see on just your local news versus who's this National Weather Service or Oceanic Institute. So they put out something more detailed that says, okay, here's the five-day chance of receiving sustained winds. And it's based on probabilities here, 5% up to 100%. So that gives you a much more accurate picture of what they expect to happen. Okay? So now you can tell them more detail. Is it going to hit me? Is it not? Again, it's still based on probabilities and forecasts models, but it's not, it's certainly more specific than this one. And the way they get to maps like this is they'll look at all the different tracks. So they have, they have dozens of models of what's going to happen to this hurricane based on past results, based on, I'm not even sure what they base these models on, or on but you can see they're very different tracks. You know, one has it going over here, what is it going over here? You know, those are hundreds of miles different. So why are these different computers and these different models coming up with different forecasts? And then how do you bring them all together? Right? Just like when we talked about polls, you often see in the news polls of polls, which are, okay, let's look at the top five or seven polls and figure out based on those what the actual forecast is going to be. Now, how do you decide which one of these is right? Do you weight them all equally and just choose the average? Do you say, well, you know, the scientists who did this one here have been accurate 90% of the time in the past, so we're going to give that one double the weight as the other ones? Mm -hmm. These are all the things that go into forecasts. You know, you see a map on, I hate to pick on USA, I don't hate to pick on USA. Today. <laughs> but you see a map in USA Today, and it needs to be simple so everybody can understand it, but at the same time, you lose so much of the nuance there, and so much of the detail, and it, it's giving you the caution, but it's not giving you that sense of uncertainty, probability. And something interesting we found in researching the book is, and this is something Nate Silver actually mentions in, I forget which book it was, about forecasting versus predicting. And what the US Geological Survey does is they say they can't predict an earthquake. Predicting means that you need to say the magnitude, the timing, the location. They can't do that. They can forecast it based on the probabilities, but they're not going to predict what's going to happen. And that's something important to keep in mind when you're thinking about forecasts and probabilities and you see something in the news or somebody tells you something, is it a deterministic forecast, which means it's going to rain versus it's not going to rain, or is it probabilistic, meaning, okay, there's a 40% chance that's going to rain? Can you, can you explain what they're really saying when they say that? When they say a 40% chance? Yeah. Well, it's... Why well, from 8 to noon? Well, that's a question, right? Like, do they mean it's going to, there's a 40% chance that somewhere in the viewership area it's going to rain on that particular day? Or do they mean there's a 40% chance from, you know, 8 to 12 or whatever the news cycle covers that it's going to rain just in the county or the city? I don't know. Yeah, somebody, I would like to forecast that they're saying that in this time of year, with these humidity and these temperature and these barometric pressure conditions, four times out of ten it rains. 
I would say that's rate, what they're something. Right, right. right. Yeah, because, somebody, yeah. because these major factors are lining up, and four out of ten times that happened, they rain. I, th I think there is a better. That's just a forecast. Definition from the National Weather Service in terms of what that means. Well, I, I interviewed a local weatherman once who said he always rounds the temperature up or down to the nearest five. Right? He'll say 70 or 75 rather than 72, just because that's what people want. They want to know is it 70 or is it 75? Don't take it. Questions or thoughts on forecasting probability? <coughs> Statistical significance is a big one. So we see studies like this in the news all the time. This one was from NPR, saying even if you're lean, one soda a day ups your risk of type 2 diabetes. Well, how much does it up my risk? You look at the study, here's what NPR said, that drinking one sugar-sweet beverage every day had an 18% increased risk of developing diabetes over a decade. Well, what does that mean? When you dig into the data, this is from the actual research report they did. You can see they break it out over ages. They break it out. It was actually done in the United States and the United Kingdom. But what it means when you say that you have an 18% increased risk, when you actually read the journal, what they said was that there's a 95% confidence interval of 8.8% to 28%. And what that means is that, yes, it's possible that the increased risk is 18%, and that's what's going to get reported in the media. But a more accurate way of talking about those results is to say it's highly probable that the risk is between 8.8% and 28%. And that highly probable is at 95%. So there's a 5% chance that the risk is even outside of that range, which in and of itself is fairly large. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Who knows what a p-value is? Oh, uh, that 5% that you said there, the probability that the thing that you expect is the, the probability that whatever your hypothesis is, is wrong. Yes. Yep. Exactly. So, statistical significance refers to the probability, P, that something is true. And so the p-value measures, as Oliver said, the chance that what we're seeing, or sorry, it measures how probable it is that the effect we're seeing is real and not due to chance. And typically, what you're looking for in a scientific study is a p-value of less than 0 0.05, which means that there's less than a 5% chance that what you're seeing in this experiment you did, there's less than a 5% chance that those results are due to chance. And so how does this manifest itself in what we see? Well, you know, I just Googled diet drinks and diabetes, like because I was drinking a diet coke this afternoon. And you find all these articles and you see the link there. Well, where do these articles come from? When you see these media reports, it be, it's because there's a scientific discovery, some study done at UB or some other research university, most likely, that said, oh, here's what we found. There's an 18% risk of getting diabetes when you drink soda. And so that leads to a news report. But those scientific discoveries come only when the p-value is below 0 0.05. And so it's, it's a fair, that, the 0 0.05 is a fairly arbitrary line. You know, it's, it's typically accepted. It's been around for decades, if not centuries. But still, you might have a result where it's 0.49 or versus a result where it's 0.51, and one study gets published and one doesn't. Sorry, 0 0.051 or 0 0.049. And there's actually a term called p-hacking, where <laughs> let's say a researcher does a study and they end up with 0 0.051. Well, that's not going to get published, so they cut the sample a different way, they look at different results, maybe they repeat the study, and they find a way to get it below so that it gets published, and then it gets reported, and then they get tenure, and life is good. How are you calculating the p-value to begin with? I'm not sure exactly. I believe it has to do with the, the size of the sample. 
um, and the size of the effect. So it depends on what your hypothesis is. You're expecting some sort of distribution in the output, and uh, depending on whether Essentially, you're going to see some distribution of, of outputs. And you're kind of working backwards from the distribution that you expect to see uh, to the, the data that could have, sorry, you're working backwards from the data to the distributions that could have generated it. And it really depends specifically on the experiment that you're running. So I, I think that's one of the three variables for the experiment. You can say, I'm setting my p-value at 5% or 10% and 15 and then then if you like, if you failed at five percent, you might pass at ten or fifteen percent. But I think the experimenter gets to decide your p-value in advance. But everybody goes with five because you're not going to get published. Um, so uh, it also depends on what the experiment itself is. Uh, so for example, let's uh, let's say I flip a coin a uh, hundred times, and maybe the coin is biased. Uh, so. There's this distribution called the beta distribution, which tells me uh, if I if it came up uh, 50 times heads and 50 times tails, uh, I'm going to get that uh, distribution of values by completely by random chance. Uh, if even if the point is biased by, uh, it, it, in principle, should come up heads one time out of ten. Uh, I could still just purely by random chance end up flipping 50 heads and 50 tails just because that's the way that luck worked out. But I can compute what the probability is uh, of me coming up with 50 heads and 50 tails based on uh, whatever distribution I'm trying to compare against. And that's the value. So is that similar in concepts in any way to, so for instance, like take a human fatality or a heart failure, something kind of like you know it's going to happen like that. It's a certain thing. We just don't know that. And as you reach the time, as you close to the time, the probability goes up. All right. You get older. Right. Is there? Is that kind of related to the time that they kind of caught something there? It seems, uh, and maybe there's another term for that. Capture. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But you know, I know we talked a little bit in the book about, okay, you hear it's a one in a million chance that this part on the airplane is going to fail. It doesn't mean it's not going to fail, right? It just means you get a million times, and it's yeah. probable that in one time it's going to fail. Like the crow. The movie The Crow. You got a one in a million chance of getting a shot in the movie. They shot a million bullets, but dang, one of them would have been I, I, I don't know mm -hmm. how those. Is there, is there a term for that, uh, that, you know? In terms of part failure or something? Or, like or, 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 or uh, mortality rates in, in terms of predicting, you know, say, uh, based on, let's say, you know, people with heart disease have a certain kind of life expectancy. Uh, but obviously, as you, get, as you get older, your life expectancy is getting longer, but it's also your time. The expected time you have left is smaller. Right. Right. So I'm wondering if there's a like a whole department of statistics or something. Uh, the, 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 the I'm sure there is. I don't know. Oh, right. like that's a exponential <coughs> distribution because that's what they use for when the next earthquake is going to happen, things like that. Your okay. exponential distributions. Well, I don't know if it's normally there at all. The 1918 flu. The uh, average life expectancy had been rising since 1901, but in 1918-1919, uh, the average life expectancy actually went down because of the more of the world deaths. That's easy to apply the high mortality rates and young people not going to live. Right. Interesting. How to never make a type one or type two error. Smart ass. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> That's right, I don't either. Michael, <laughs> uh, let's talk briefly about what these are. 
right? We can have a discussion. So false positive, which is a type one error, is where you find a relationship where there isn't one. You convict the innocent. Exactly. Convict the innocent, or let's say you fly to Paris, spend a thousand dollars on your credit card, the credit card company calls, they're shutting off your card because of fraud. Because their model predicted that if someone spent, if there was a thousand dollar charge on your credit card in Paris, that it was fraud. And that's a false positive. Versus a false negative, type two error, is where you're missing an actual relationship. Free the guilty. OJ. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Okay. This is very important for the other biometrics. This is very important. I always type one error to stop people who are authorized for using the system. We type two errors and it allows people who are not authorized in. So, okay, we want to have, there, there's a graph where the, the crossover point, the lower the, the crossover point is, the more accurate your biometric yeah, identification system. So are you trying to reduce type 1 or type 2 or both at the same time? Re reduce type 1 and type 2 because the crossover point is the actual net uh, measure of your accuracy. Okay. And what's an acceptable error rate? Depends on the system. Depends on who you're talking to. Depends on uh, the value of the information you're protecting. If I'm in a nuclear uh, facility, I want as good as strong yeah. protection as I can get. It's the air hole. Yeah, just uh, for a quick thing, one of the, it, I could be wrong, but I, one of the things that I heard we did early on after September 11th with the wands in the airports, they would test you for metal detection, right, with the wand, and because they didn't know the machine well enough, they all turned them up with the highest sensitivity, which meant that was able to catch a paper clip but not a pistol. Okay. Yeah, this, there was so much metal that it wouldn't detect right. Right, so that like type two, type one, and type two errors. Yeah, really. The the harder you try and catch the guilty, the more likely you are to convict the innocent, and vice versa. So type one and type two are going yeah, going up. Yeah, it's it's, it's impossible wow. because once you once your your test tries to catch this, it errors on that. When you try and catch this, you err on that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. It's a horrible paradox. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. So. Your example, as you said, you know, freeing the guilty, or example here, you know, let's say you're smoking marijuana every day, take a drug test, drug test doesn't find anything in your system. That's a type two error. So how do you not make one? A few thoughts, you know, looking at the p-value, we talked about 0.05. <laughs> 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 look, at the, look at the size of the effect. You know, and that's something we talk about a lot as well in the book is about the magnitude of something. You know, if you read that drinking coffee is bad for you, well, if you get into the article and you find, okay, it's going to shorten your life by five minutes, is that something you're worth trading off? Look at the magnitude of the effect. And then precision. How large is that confidence interval? You know, just like margin of error in a poll, that 4.4%, now you've got it on both sides, is there a way to narrow that down? So with statistical significance, can the results be due to random chance? A lot of times the answer is yes. What does statistically significant mean? Is that it's 95% likely for the result to be within those confidence levels? And just remember that what you're seeing in the media is driven by research, which is driven by those P levels. Any questions or thoughts about statistical significance? Let's talk about misrepresentation. This is one we see a lot, you know, how many hours should I spend at the gym? Let me look at a chart and see. Let's start with all the data. So what this shows is what is the percent reduction in my mortality risk when I spend more time exercising. So as you would expect, if I spend zero time versus zero to 7.5, I'm gonna have a reduction in my mortality rate, more likely to live longer. If I spend even more time, it's even better more time, it's even better. So at some point, 75 hours a week, now there's diminishing returns. Okay. So this is the raw data. But what, let's say, you now my wife is nagging me to go to the gym. I don't want to go. So what do I do? I say, honey, look at this. You know, what did I do here? 
all I did was I changed the scale of the chart. So instead of starting at zero and going up to 45, I start at 15 and go up to 95. So there's a ton of blank space up here, and you don't see that zero line. Okay. Let's say I'm a trainer at the gym, and I'm trying to convince my clients that they really should work out more. Well, I'm going to start at 20, keep this bar in, and cut it off before I start to get that plateau or those diminishing returns. If you want to trick people into staying home, let's flip the data and start with the highest value over on the left and move to the right. So it seems like it's actually going down, right? For people who aren't very statistically good. <laughs> Here's a fun one. If you look at the change in the percentage reduction rather than the actual percentage, you get a very different graph as well. So which one is right? Well, they all are. <coughs> Depending on what story you're trying to tell and what point you're trying to make, you can use any of those. One thing we always caution people about <laughs> is watching out for circles. Now, these represent the same data, but one is using the area of a circle to show it, and one is showing the diameter. You know, and what happens is, I think I've got this right, when you double the circle's diameter, you actually quadruple the circle's area. Alright, right. everyone's seen this before, I assume, hanging up in your classroom in elementary school. Does anybody know what this type of map is called? Mercator. Exactly, Mercator. So, Mercator, back in the 1500s, 1600s, he designed this map, and his goal was to help sailors plot more accurate routes. And so he figured out a way to project out from a globe onto from a 3D surface onto a 2D surface so that if a sailor was plotting a course, he could just draw a straight line, get where he's going. But the problem with the Mercator projection is that the farther an object is from the equator, the more distorted it appears. And when you think about it in reality, Africa is about 14 times larger than Greenland. Right? That's a fact. But when you look at it here, Africa and Greenland look like they're the same size. Because Greenland is so far away from the equator, it gets expanded more. And you end up with this huge distortion. Right? So, I mean, and this has implications in terms of economics, in terms of political issues. Right? If you're trying to think, I mean, think back to the um, electoral college map where people say, oh, you know, the country's mostly red, so that's who most of the people voted for. If you think Greenland is really that large, you're going to give them more significance than they truly deserve. And conversely, if you think Africa is really that small compared to everybody else, you're going to have a misunderstanding of the world as well. This is called, uh, let's see, a Winkle triple projection, and this is a more accurate view of this, the actual size of the continents. And here you see you know, the true size of Africa versus Greenland and everybody else. You get misrepresentation as well when you talk about language. Right? Doping will cause ongoing emotional harm to athletes, says a leading sports psychologist. Who is a leading sports psychologist? What does that mean? Right? There's Some, no way somebody to... Somebody that would talk to the news. Someone that would talk to the news, right? Like, I used to work in advertising for many, many years. I still do some ad work. And we would look for these phrases all the time. You know, we did a lot of hospital ads and doctor ads where it's leading researchers say or experts recommend, top scientists advise. Well, who's a top scientist? Are you top in your industry, nationwide, globally, at your college, in this room? Who's an expert? Right. I mean, an expert in some fields, like you know, if you're testifying in front of a judge, you can define what an expert is. But in many cases, it's not that clear. So when you're thinking about mis misrepresentation, is the data true? Think about what scale is being used on the chart and pay attention to the language. Here's a fun example about putting it all together. Um, has anyone here gone on Zillow to look at the price of homes? So this is the home where I grew up in Montfort, currently valued, or when I took this screenshot, at $120,000. What does that mean? Zillow uses something that they call a Zestimate. And that Zestimate for this home was $120,000. The Zestimate has a median error rate 
of 5%. What that means is that half of the, S, half of the estimates in an area are closer than that percentage, and half are further off. So, and every area has a different median error rate. So, and that just, that's a measure of precision, right? So, in an area where they may not have a lot of data, that median error rate may be 5%. So you've got 5% plus or minus the price of the home. In an area where there's a lot more data, you might be 2% or 3%. So here's an example of how that works. Let's say their estimate is $120,000. Well, what that could really mean, based on the median error rate, is that they're saying the price is probably between 114,000 and 126,000, but it's only for half of these homes. So people look at that estimate and say, well, my home is worth $120,000, and I want you as my realtor to list it for that. Well, that's not what the data is saying. <laughs> it's not a forecast. It's a snapshot in time. A lot of it is self-reported data, because as a homeowner, you can have influence on that. You can actually write to them and say, this is what my home is worth, we just did these improvements, you know, and they can update it based on that. What is the sample? If they're looking at homes within a specific geographic area, well, are they capturing your neighborhood accurately? You know, one street over, is there a vast difference that they're not capturing? And it's a proprietary formula as well, so you don't, as transparent as Zillow is about it, and they are fairly transparent, you can go on their website and read about how they calculate it. It's still proprietary, they're not giving away all their secrets. So let's talk about applying this info in real life. I, I, can, I can add yes. one little detail to the Zillow, because my wife is a realtor. The, what realtors do is they look for the comps, they call it, the comparable sales in the area. They look at any house that's sold nearby, they get its square foot price, and they multiply that by your house's square feet. That's, that's your estimate. And when I compare her method to the Zillow, it's pretty close. So Zillow is using the comps to calculate your square footage estimate. But just like going back to the first example, if Bill Gates' income and the monks, if, if somebody over, gets an overpriced sale of their house because they're laundering money or they're handing it down to their children but they want to sell it, you know, they, you can really have things goof up the estimator. Yeah. But National Grid isn't doing the same thing when they're sending you yeah. your energy reports and they're sending you the energy reports of you and all your neighbors averaged out. So if you live in a development of 2,000 square foot homes, and you're surrounded by a bunch of homes that are a thousand square feet, but maybe 50 years old, the numbers are very skewed. Yes. Or, or in my case, I got all kinds of LED shit in my house, <laughs> but I drive a Volt, and they think I'm five times more wasteful than my average. Because <laughs> I don't buy gas in there. And all I plug in once a night. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they're only looking at your electricity use. Exactly. Your overall yeah. energy footprint. Exactly. Right. They also take into account uh, home sales and uh, things can be listed as sales that aren't. Um, so for example, when you're looking to buy our house, uh, the house that we ended up buying had sold for a tenth of the price that it was listed for. That freaked us out until we found out that that was the, um, the uh, realtor ended up telling us that this was uh, refinancing the, the couple lived there before refinanced their mortgage, and that counted as a sale for a tenth of the price, so. Nice. And I'm sure your wife would never choose different comps if she was a seller's agent versus the buyer's agent, right? Yeah, if you, no, if, if you hire a certified appraiser to tell you how much a particular property is worth, it seems like one of the main things they do is they look for comparable properties <coughs> what they sold for and sometimes I have seen some where I'm not sure the comparables were that comparable yeah. so, so if you got a neighborhood like some streets in Amherst where there, there's a row of 27 houses that look identical then the price of one might mean something about the price of the other but look at some of the older neighborhoods where the houses are all different it's not so that's not such a good there, there is a funny thing about what you just said, like that I realized it's a bad signal. But the um, okay, 
in real estate, the, the realtors are legally bound to try and get people to a mill. You know, sometimes there's unreasonable, so you're never going to have a deal happen. But they're they're supposed to get people to come to a reasonable middle ground somehow. They're not supposed to amp it up. But because all their commissions are percentage based, the buyer's agent and the seller's agent both get paid more when the price is higher, which I think is the the, the forcing reason why real estate has booms and busts because you'll force up to overpriced everywhere and then it has to break because it, it's too overvalued and it'll break and then and it'll keep doing that. Yeah. I could be wrong, but yeah. Alright, so let's look at a question that came from Alan. What your point was, what do you do when real data is irrelevant to the conversation and what people are going past? And, and my response was, do you want to be right, or do you want to change someone's mind? Uh -huh. And they're very different, right? If you want to be right, you dig up more facts, and you prove your point with those facts, and that's how you're right. But that doesn't mean you're going to change somebody's mind with that data. To change someone's <coughs> mind, in my opinion, you have to think about their confirmation bias. People don't want to think that they were wrong. Using a political example, people who voted for Trump don't want to think that that was the wrong choice that they made when they're voting again in the next election. Yeah, and there have been studies about this. Even after the evidence has been totally refuted, people fail to make revisions in their beliefs. They want to be right. And Michael, I believe, brought up the Rappaport's rules. So we can go through those briefly here. So attempt to re-express your target's position clearly, <coughs> vividly, Fairly, which is important. List any points of agreement, especially if they're not generally or widespread, like widespread agreed upon. Talk about what you've learned from your target. And only after that, talk about, you know, rebut them or offer your criticism. You know, I get in Facebook and Twitter fights with people all the time, and it's, you can't convince people Sometimes any conversation that begins with "listen, asshole." <laughs> <laughs> I've been on both sides of those conversations, and they never end well. No, no. But even if you're, even if you're perfectly civil and you're just giving people facts, if they aren't the facts they want to hear, or they don't align with their worldview, or it contradicts something that they already have in their head, you're going to have a hard time. So let's go back to some of the examples we talked about in the beginning. How could this be misleading? It's a mean average. Bill Gates. Okay. It was a mean average. Is that homeowners or households? Where the people I believe it was households, um, not just homeowners, so it included people in apartments and such. But what we found here was that. Yes, that's true that the average American household owes $90,000, but the average American household with debt was $130,000. So when you look at everybody with debt, a lot of people have zero debt, a lot of people have a lot of debt. So that, the people with zero are going to bring that average down to 90. If you really want to get a sense of what's the debt problem in the United States, let's look at the people who have that debt and calculate it that way. Well, how are you distinguishing between what's debt and what's owed? Because to me, the same thing. Credit card debt versus yeah, mortgage credit, debt? I think it was all together. I think it was credit card and mortgage and all of that. So any debt. Okay. Yeah. So if you consider a house debt, it's not undervalued? It's not underwater? I think they did for this example because I don't think the actual debt numbers are that high. But it's a good question. I'd have to go back to the So this one, an example of correlation and causation, right? Starbucks increases neighborhood and home values? No, not really, because what happens is that Starbucks comes and puts their <laughs> stores in neighborhoods that have a lot of wealthy people, right? That's why so, stores brought babies. Right. right. So it's actually reverse causation. Yeah, right? people built houses and stores like chimneys. So. This one was an 
on one, one in five CEOs are psychopaths? Well, they actually, they weren't talking about CEOs, they were supply chain professionals. I think the study was done in Australia, and they only studied 261 people. Is that really a large enough sample to determine that one in five are psychopaths? That's a lot of supply chain. Still seems <laughs> worse than the study in Australia. When you look at Buffalo being ranked the third best food city worldwide, well, yeah, it was based on one iconic dish. It was based on chicken wings. So what National Geographic did was they looked at the iconic food from cities around the world, and then they put together a list. And what was interesting was that they didn't even rank them. They just said, here's the list of 10 cities. And Buffalo was number three on the list. They never referred to it as a ranking. But when it got reported, especially by the local media, hey, you're right. We're in a big time now. Flying there on the This one, are you hungry? Best to eat first and shop later. For this one, what they did, they studied 89 undergraduate <laughs> students. And they weren't having them shop for things that college students would usually shop for. They gave them a pile of paper clips, or binder clips in this case, and they looked at how many binder clips the students, quote, shopped for when they were hungry versus not hungry. So it's a lab experiment. Does it apply to the real world? Maybe, maybe not. Charlie's favorite here, grilled cheese lovers. <laughs> Great example of self-reported data. So they asked people, do you have more sex? Yes, no. And it was done by a dating website. And there was a marketing stunt. It was done for National Real Cheese. <laughs> so this was their attempt just to get some news. And probably why this was reported in HuffPo and not the New York Times. And then one of my favorites, have a beer, it's good for your brain. Well, if you read the story, they find out that the study wasn't done on seniors, it wasn't done on adults, it wasn't done on college students, it was done on mice. It was done on baby mice, and the amount of beer, the equivalent in humans, was 28 kegs. So, if you, yeah, if you're like a young mouse and you have 28 kegs of beer, maybe it's good for your brain. But if you're it just getting the headlines... <laughs> Does the unit of time really matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a certain value I mean, that here. Really <laughs> yeah, exactly. But just scanning the headlines, you're never going to pick up this nuance. And a lot of times, just even reading the article. How about you know, the red wine and the blue chip? I haven't seen that one. Yeah, one glass of red wine. That's it. Thank you for asking questions. So now we've got single points of data, single studies, that sort of thing. What happens when you start smashing this stuff together to farm connections to like big data? Okay. This is a database group that you get enormous <coughs> amounts of data in some of these like click screen data, you know click screen data. Let's explain click screen data. Every time somebody clicks something on the internet, it's recorded. And a lot of the prices that internet uh, businesses charge yeah. come from yeah. this data. That's why there's so much, you know, uh, click on the um, I can't see how all of these errors wouldn't be multiplied mm -hmm. in a big data environment. So, what do you do with this? I don't know your specific line of work, so I don't know exactly how to do that. I would say just keep digging and keep looking for it. One thing my, my co-author said is that he goes into companies like, like Google and Hershey and looks at their data, and a lot of times they don't even know what data they have, or they've coded it wrong, or it's on different systems, or you know, one database is here, one is here, and you might have collected, you know, you might have collected age ranges in one way in this database, but in a different range in another one. So yeah, I, I would imagine that it's going to absolutely be right. I, I think what I see here is looking forward to the <coughs> Toolbox, and but if you give someone a toolbox for brand new hammers and saws and whatnot, they're not going to be able to have to build a house right away because it's, it's specific to your knowledge and domain, right? So just it's a set of examples of toolbox that you have to figure out how to apply to your That's my takeaway from this, uh, and I've encountered these things. I I work uh, with database. Uh, 
And what I found is that a lot of the problems come from dirty data that isn't really intentional error, but people trying to distort things to send a message. I mean, it's a big part of it, but it's because, you know, hookstream is a perfect example, I think, uh, is that you have to do a lot of processes that you find outliers that are actually because of some malfunction in a system, nothing to do with anything that is bad numbers. Or formatting errors, just texts, uh, and other misfires that happen in the process. And that can accumulate in a big data situation in a, in a human way. Uh, so 80% of the work in a big data matchup is cleaning and wondering and wrangling your data is ultimately going to do some kind of visualization or charts or report or something. If you don't do the 80%, you results <laughs> how do you know what to do for that 80%? Like, how do you know when you're cleaning up an outlier or when that's a valid data that's, point? That's hard. It's hard work because it's a lot to go through. It's a lot of automation. They're also being able to stop the process along the assembly line. It's really a pipeline of different steps a lot of times. And being able to take slices of your data and look at it and look for things that seem off or run, uh, run validations programmatically you need to do a visualization and kind of see what it looks like and you see like stuff way off somewhere like it's a lot of stuff you kind of know. Um, if you, a lot of it just comes from having the expectation how it's supposed to be because of this familiarity so as you work on it you start so is this part of the ETL process? Yeah, you know, it could be, or even just anything. That, to, to, to the simple-minded and not terribly useful answer is you got to really look at the data and where did it come from. And you got to look at the values and what do they really mean to somebody. And do they mean the same thing to a number of people? And, and, and I can see something that says order date. Well, what does that really mean? Can they match all these on order date? Or does it mean the data was ordered, the data was shipped? They, you know, you don't really, you really got to spend a lot of time digging to understand what this data is. And then maybe, if you're clever enough, you can figure out a way to make some sense out of it. Um, I know it's too turn to turn around the problem stuff that you face, but uh, like in the beginning, you you said you know seventeen thousand men were pregnant and were pregnant. <laughs> um, have you found that uh, more binary statements are more damaging to uh, to questions like a yes no thing, or have you seen more uh, like multiple choice? Like let's say there's a you know ICD ten codes or something like that that you're looking at that you know this is pregnant, this is diabetes, this is whatever. Kind of thing. Have you seen uh, samples more skewed by yes or no's, or by uh, or kind of even out if there's more multiple choice things? Or yeah, it's a good question. I I haven't seen any specifically like that. I would imagine that if there are more variations, just like what we saw the electoral maps, right? You get a more accurate picture of what's really happening. With binary, it's easy to put that switch one way or another. There's, I mean, I'm sure you know there's issues with survey design as well, or with pricing models where you give people three versus four on a survey of one to ten. You know, do you do your survey responses one to ten, or one to eight, or one to five? And you can skew your, you can skew your questions in order to get some results as well. So you have much chance to pick your partner's brain and all the same A little bit when we were writing the book, yeah. But I know that some people say a lot of these surveys existence of cell phones makes cell phone or makes phone surveys kind of suspect. Uh, I don't know anymore except to say I've heard that. Push phone. Yeah, push polls are an issue. I mean, some people still have landlines. Some some polls include landlines. Some don't. And the ones that don't include landlines, they're going to skew younger, um, more Hispanic, you know, because people with landlines tend to be older. Oh, well, my wife's one of her big complaints is. A lot of these people that call with surveys and ask very leading questions. And, and, and they don't ask, 
objective kinds of questions. Yeah. But but your wife answers the phone, right? Yeah. I, I hear that and I just hang up. So yeah. who's <laughs> answering those calls? Oh, sorry, you know. <laughs> I, I would think that like his question about whether the binary is less accurate than the, the granular, I would say absolutely, because like Facebook at one time only had the like button. And I remember a whole bunch of people bitching about that because they were like, somebody reports a death in their family, you can't like it. Where's the acknowledge button? Where's the, you know, so having having one way to answer, if, if you only have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So you have to have errors in there if you don't have enough choices. Yeah. Makes sense. So the other one, too, that I Did somebody aggregate my data before you got to it? You were working with something that's already been aggregated, or however, by this code or something, and then you're aggregating the raw data, that's a potential to get to Right. The nuance was smoothed away by somebody picking the categories correctly. What about, you know, deliver falsification with a box? Load enough boxes with survey, they don't tell you anything. It doesn't matter what the reality of what people really think, right? I have all these responses, even though they're automated machine responses. Yeah. Grand Grand Paul was going to win in 2009. That's right. And that's an issue with internet polls as well. I mean, you get an internet poll about the election, you've got people from Russia or wherever voting because they're online versus a phone survey, which won't obviously won't include it. Yeah. And the singer from Amherst kept winning on who's pet talent or whatever yeah. all the yeah. Yeah. show was because Stanford's high schoolers were back in the polls. So yeah, I love it. Yeah. 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 Curious, if you did this talk to a, a group of uh, marketing folks, if they have the same, you sort of giving them a handbook. Is that similar reactions? <laughs> a lot of them already know it. Like yes. they appreciate the parts about you know, sampling, especially the cherry. I mean, cherry picking is huge in marketing and advertising. Um, what's different, honestly, is that giving a talk to a group like this, you already understand the basic concepts of sampling and causation and things like that. Versus other groups I speak to, these are fairly new concepts for them. He's giving away the game. He's. he's, he's <laughs> He's the, uh, what do you call it, the immunization as opposed to the virus. <laughs> I don't know, he's only the he's only point of one. one. <laughs> I've got like 40 emails in my in my inbox telling me I can trust everything the dude tells me. Yeah, so I don't know how reliable this guy is. <laughs> oh, so, yes, yeah, so yeah. I wanted to add to the, you know, arguing with people that you can't win with. Just, this is an anecdote from my own personal experience. There was a point in my history where I was sure that evolution was a scammy thing. And the reason I was at that conclusion wasn't because of religious reasons or anything like that. It was that I had heard that racists were using evolution to claim that whites were superior to blacks. So my position was against evolution. And I was in that position for a long time, but there was many different things on the internet that I ran into people that were saying something to prove that I was wrong. Not once did I ever say thank you for helping me find out that I was wrong, but each one of those nicked away at the wall I had built around that thought, right? So each one of those people that contributed to my ignorance, to, to reversing my ignorance, helped convince me that I was wrong, but not one of them got thanked. And it took a long period of time. So it's the, what I'm, my point is, is when you argue with somebody that's arguing from ignorance, you're not, it's not a futile experience. You're not doing nothing. You're actually chipping a little bit away from I was going to sign off Facebook forever today. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. You cannot, these, these are arguments you cannot win in one sitting or in one yeah. they, Some of them take longer than others. But yeah, I, I have went from a position of ignorance like and, and really staunch ignorance about it to better now. Like you like your shirt, your erosion has more <laughs> You're eroding away. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen yeah. Jacobs, in this measure of man, talks exactly about how racist is. Uh, 
misrepresent what we do. You might find it very interesting. Yeah. So, arguing with that, yeah. it does work, just not right away. <laughs> just not at once. Yeah, you can't try to have it. Even now, look at one button at the back. That's right. You know, the joke about the sandwich shop, right? Guy comes in and says, sign to the store and says, oh, we'll make any, any kind of sandwich in the world. Guy comes in and says, I want an elephant sandwich. Waiter, just like his eyes real white, goes to the back, comes back. The boss says, we can't cut up a whole elephant, just make a sandwich. <laughs> this is terrific. Thank you so much. Where do we get this book? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Okay. Um, I have a sample here if anyone wants to take a look at it. But I'm not here, honestly, I'm not here to sell books. I just wanted to seem like an interesting group to talk about. I, I can recommend the book. It is kind of interesting. It's not a heavy duty statistics book, but it's kind of basic, easy to follow explanations of a lot of these ideas. And you don't have to be a mathematician to read it. In fact, a mathematician would probably hate it. But then it's I mean, we got a lot of feedback like that. I mean, someone who expects this to be a statistics textbook is not going to appreciate it. Someone with an advanced level of knowledge about statistics, this is, you know, you're already way past this. But you know someone who needs to understand basic concepts like this talk, so I have a question kind of related to, it's, uh, on, it's on a topic, maybe, maybe not expecting this, but is, is there a backstory about writing a book? Are you guys authors by perfection and did other books, or is there, like, how did you come about? Sure, good question. So um, we went to high school together. He went off and got his PhD in economics from MIT and then started this economic consulting firm. And as part of that, what he does is he sits down with people who are not statisticians, with lawyers, with clients, with judges, and needs to explain things like correlation, like outliers, like for this one case, you know, why this data point is an outlier. And my background is in writing. So I've worked in journalism, I do a lot of, I've been a copywriter, um, you know, working on advertising campaigns and writing websites and brochures and such. So what I specialize in is explaining complicated things in a way that anybody can understand. So he saw a need for this book in that you know, there's so many people out there who are not statistically literate, and he gave me a call and said we should write it. That's how it happened. It took a couple years, but I was actually my next question was how long. thanks for Yeah, it took about, I mean, the bulk of the book we wrote in about eight months, but the entire process took about three years. And this is why you go ahead and jobs. Well, this turned into my day job for a while. But. Well, and then what happened is the two of them applied and gave a TEDx talk a year ago, and I met Mike, and it turns out we have some connection with people that we know and so on, and, and I thought he'd give us a good talk. I haven't heard that other talk, and I'm taking a look at the book. So, so just a, a plug about sampling. We, we did a community survey for the group back in August. We've got yeah. about six responses, <laughs> which is really a lot to make decisions based on. I do so like it. it's, 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 yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you get a chance, fill it out. And, uh, I think there's a URL with our Twitter alias, and uh, I think it was posted on the meetup group for a couple weeks or a couple months. And, uh, it's also in forms. <laughs> your, your problem there is that it's a self-selecting sample. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Nobody leaves this room until they. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.